we present the Richard Tauber story. The story of Richard Tauber will be told by Evelyn Lay. Those are the bells of Linz Cathedral, one of the first sounds Richard Tauber ever heard. For he was born in Linz, in Austria, on the 16th of May, 1891. Another of the familiar sounds of his infancy was this. of operetta. His mother played two bread parts in the company at the Municipal Theatre in Linz. Richard's nursery was the theatre dressing room and his toys were the contents of property baskets instead of toy trains there were real ones when the company was on tour. The talk around him was of the theatre, of travel to distant places and of music. Always of music. His parents separated. And when Richard was six he went to live with his father in Berlin. His father was a classical actor. He played in Goethe, Shakespeare, and Schiller. Richard's greatest treat was to be allowed to go and watch his father rehearsing. He spent much of his spare time when school was ended at amateur theatricals and in singing. He sang by ear the popular songs of the day. It was while on holiday with his father in the Tyrol that he made his first public appearance. He was nine, and he sang at a concert. When Richard was 13, his father joined the company at the court theatre at Wiesbaden, and Richard was moved to school there. He was hopeless at school, unruly and disinterested. It was the same with his music lessons. He threw them up and then proceeded to teach himself. He decided, while still in his early teens, that he wanted to be a singer. He haunted the gallery of the opera house, and the singers were his idols. His father tried to talk him out of the idea. Something safe as a career, my boy, like a lawyer or a doctor. However, he sent Richard to sing to two independent judges, a famous baritone in Vienna and the principal conductor in Wiesbaden. Has this boy any talent, any voice? In both cases, the answer was a very definite no. Nevertheless, in response to Richard's insistence, he was sent to Frankfurt to a college of music for a general musical education. He was then a slim, quiet boy of 17 who wore spectacles and showed quite outstanding promise. As a conductor... But singing was still his ambition. He gave an audition to a well-known teacher, Professor Karl Beinis, 
He sang his usual audition piece from Lohengrin. It was Professor Bynes who discovered Richard's voice. Stop screaming and forcing your voice like that, he said. You'll never sing Wagner in a thousand years. Sing softly, softly, and it will be beautiful. You have a bel canto voice, a voice for Mozart, for Schubert. Oh, muse divine, throughout those dark hours, when life holds not its dreary path my heart to waken to thy power and make my soul respond to thy song my soul respond to For two years, Richard studied with Karl Beines, and then he made his debut at the Municipal Theatre in Chemnitz in Saxony. It was the 2nd of March, 1913. Mozart's The Magic Flute was C. Richard Pauber as Tamino. <laughs> Within only a few days, Richard was offered a five-year contract at the Royal Opera House Dresden, one of the most important opera houses in Germany. His first appearance there was as the prince in Aubert's Mass and Yellow. He took over the part at only three days' notice. He had an uncanny gift for learning a role quickly. Percy Kahn can vouch for that. He was Richard's accompanist and coach for over 15 years. Richard Tauber learned easily because he was a superb musician. I have accompanied many great singers and Richard was the greatest musician of them all, and perhaps the most charming to work with. During my 15 years association with him as his accompanist and coach, we toured the five continents of the world together, and the inevitable discomforts of travel were minimized by his huge enjoyment of practically every moment of life. Any outburst of temperament was quickly dispelled by laughter. I remember one occasion when we had to make a long train journey in the depths of an Australian winter in an unheated train. Richard decided to make a real fuss. He made an impassioned statement to the press. He was going to take the matter further. His anger changed to delight when he noticed a misprint in a newspaper report of the matter the following day. It read, Mr. Tauber said that if he had caught a chill, he would be unable to sin for a fortnight. <laughs> but those world travels were still to come. Richard years at Dresden were years of steady progress. He made guest appearances at other opera houses. His phenomenal memory was a great asset. If a tenor was wanted to learn a part in the hurry, send for young Tauber at Dresden. In 1919, he sang for the first time at the State Opera Berlin. He learned most of the leading tenor roles in the operatic repertoire. <laughs> I'm 
In Germany and Austria, the dividing line between opera and operetta has never been so clearly defined as it has in other countries. Most opera houses include the work of Johann Strauss in their repertoires, so that together with Fidelio and Don Giovanni and La Traviata, Richard also appeared in The Gypsy Baron and The Night in Venice. It was in 1922, by which time Richard had become the best-known operatic tenor in Germany and Austria, that he met someone who was to change the course of his whole career, Franz Lehár. One evening he went to the Theatre under Wien and saw Lehár's operetta, Fraschkita. He was enchanted with the melodies. He told Lehár so. What's more, he said, he would like to sing in a production of it. For years, Lehar had been hoping for a voice like Talbot's to interpret his songs, so a production was arranged. And the music of the breeze 
as it wanders me to trees, whispering this refrain, oh love is Kalba's success in Frashkita was phenomenal. He was used to the adulation of the comparatively small opera-going public, but the demonstrations of affection of a mass public was a new and exciting experience. The world of opera shook its head. We've lost our best Mozart singer, mourned Bruno Walter. How can that glorious voice be wasted in operetta, said others. Said Richard, I don't sing operetta. I sing Leha. And so he made arrangements that when his opera engagements permitted, he would sing the leading part in Leha's next piece, Paganini. Altogether, Richard was to play in seven of Leha's operettas. In each of them was a special Talba song. Here's his friend, Bernard Groom, to explain. Leha once told me, we are brothers, Richard and I, even without the luxury of blood relationship. Their characters were different, but both loved the theater passionately, both were modest and hardworking, and both superb musicians. Mm. In each of the later Leha scores, there's, of course, the Tauber song. Ah, that special song which gave Richard his great opportunity. Yes. And often it was Richard himself who detected the gem. Once he called Leha's attention to 16 hidden bars in one of his old operettas. Oh, good gracious. Yes, quite nice, the tune, said the composer. But, no but, commanded Taube. I want to sing it. And the 16 bars became, you are my heart's delight. Really? It was the supreme moment in every show when Richard took the stage alone. The audience held their breath, and then his voice filled the theater, the voice anybody would recognize amongst the thousand tenor voices. When he ended, people clapped and whistled and shouted encore, and Richard obliged four, five, six times, pianissimo, fortissimo, smiling, crying in French, in German, in Italian, and once, I remember, in Land of Smiles, in some lingo I couldn't quite make out, so I asked him afterwards, Richard, what sort of language was that? He looked at me innocently. Why, of course, Chinese. <laughs> so let's listen to one of the most beautiful of all Tauber songs now. O Maiden, My Maiden, from Frederica. Leha operetta, Talba reached a new peak of success. His popularity was fantastic. There was a Talba craze, to the extent of a popular song being published in 1929, Wenn ich Richard Talba wäre. His gramophone record sold in astronomical figures, just how many he made, nobody's ever counted. Oscar Preuss made some hundreds with him in this country. Yes, just how many, of course, I would think perhaps two to three hundred. And one of the extraordinary things with Richard was that he insisted on a cash payment for these recordings rather than a royalty. Did he? Always. It puzzles me, but uh, I presume he had his own reasons, but quite obviously had he taken a royalty, his earnings would have been very much bigger than they were. I think it was on his second visit to this country that he asked me to get him a first-class orchestra together, as he wanted to make some records of an operette that he had composed in Vienna some years earlier called The Singing Dream. These records were, he said, purely for his own pleasure. I, of course, had heard that Talbot was a first-class conductor, but uh, I wasn't really very interested in that angle. The orchestra only knew him as a singer and were prepared for the worst. I went into the studio, however, at the finish, and was astonished to hear the ovation given him by the members of the orchestra. Thank you, Mr. Price. 
You reminded me of a side of Richard's career that hadn't yet we hadn't yet touched on, his composing. Over the years, he wrote a considerable number of songs and orchestral pieces and several operettas. The singing Dream was a great success in Austria and in Germany, but it was never produced here. Let's hear a song from it now. Du bist der Welt, war mir. You mean the world to me. In September 1929, rehearsals began for the world premiere in Berlin of Lehar's piece that was to be the greatest triumph of them all, Land of Smiles. It was such a success that offers came pouring in from all over the world. Arrangements were made for Richard to come to London for a production at Drury Lane Theatre. McQueen Pope, our good friend Popey, has memories of this great occasion. It was my job to publicize the show and him too. He was quite unknown in this country. When his train steamed in Victoria, he was standing at the window, and he saw the station filled with a vast crowd. He waved and smiled at them delightedly. But they hadn't come to see him. They'd come to see King Alfonso of Spain, who oh. just abdicated. But Dalva never knew that. We didn't tell him. He was much photographed. We got him on the engine, pretending to drive it, and that pleased him too. But when he first arrived at Drury Lane, he went straight to the box office, and he shook hands all round with the box office staff. He said they were the men who took the money, and it was best to be friends. And he was a considerable handicap in those early days. He did not, he would not, rehearse properly. Sometimes he never came at all, and when he did, he just walked through. We never heard him sing. Even at the dress rehearsal, he never opened out. So we were not by any means happy in our minds. But when the first night came, well, then we heard him. I don't think he ever sang better. There were countless encores for you are my heart's delight, and the audience would not let the show go on. And at the end, well, the scenes resembled those which follow the winning goal at a cup final at Wembley rather than the first night at a London theatre. I shall never forget it. But 
of Landers Smiles at Drury Lane ended, Richard returned to Germany. He'd formed his own film company and was making a number of German films. In one of them, the Melody de Liebe, in the supporting cast was a young actor named Anton Warbrook. Yes, it's a long time ago and I'd nearly forgotten the film. But what I had not forgotten was his incredible kindness to us youngsters. He was very helpful and was never a great star. I remember distinctly one day he gave me a lift home from the studio in a taxi. And we reached our destination. He paid the driver and gave him four or five marks as a tip. Although it was none of my business, I just gasped. Because it seemed a bit ridiculous large. Tarba shrugged and grinned and said, You wait. I have to pay that. We wait a few years. When you are a star, maybe you have to pay it yourself. <laughs> and did you do the same? Not quite. You see, I'm only an actor. He was a terror. Had you met Richard before you made the film? No, I've never met him personally, but I heard and saw him for the first time in my life in 20 or 21 in Munich in the Opera House when he sent Don Octavio in Don Giovanni. And the incredible thing is, 25 years later, when he joined the Viennese Opera to sing exactly the same part, I had heard rumors that he was very ill, in fact doomed. I didn't go to the opera, but I sat at home and listened to his voice. The voice wasn't half what it used to be anymore, but his artistry was superb and unforgettable. Thank you, Anton. Still on the crest of the wave, Talbo went to New York and paid several visits to London. The world seemed to be at his feet, but there was trouble in store. March 1933, the rise of Hitler and the Nazis. Richard was a Catholic and remained one all his life, but his father had been Jewish, and so he was no longer welcome, welcome in Germany. He moved his headquarters from Berlin to London and signed a contract to make some films here. The first was Blossom Time, a musical biography of Franz Schubert. Um, there is 
can't find without a care A heart of free Dear love came along at last one day No gallant night was he A humble youth of Starting with Richard in Blossom Time was Jane Baxter. When Richard Tarber walked into the studio, it was like the sun coming out. He was so warm and friendly and expansive, he had a tremendous personality. Blossom Time was directed by Paul Stein, who had been a friend of Tarber since they were boys together in Berlin. Richard always called him Lulu. Of course, Schubert was never married, so he and I couldn't get married in the film. Instead, I married Carl Esmond, and Richard sang in the church. He sang a song called Love Lost Forever, which struck me as rather a depressing choice for a <laughs> wedding. We finished the film on location in Vienna. While we were there, I was able to hear Richard singing at the opera house in Franz Lehar's new operetta, Judita, which at that time was his latest success. Thank you, Jane. His next film was called Heart's Desire, and it featured a song that would almost be associated with him, a real Calva song, Vienna City of My Dreams. Dressed like a queen with life so gay You are the love of my heart today Fair, mine Laughter and music and stars that shine Wonderful city where I while in London, Richard met and married a young English actress. She played opposite him in Heart's Desire, Diana Napier. I first met Richard at the premiere of one of my films. Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. introduced us. I'm not a very musical person, and I'm afraid the name Richard Tauber didn't mean as much to me when we were introduced as it should have done. I just had an impression of a plump, beaming man with a charming smile who was fixing a monocle in his eye and speaking to me in an amazing mixture of broken English, French and German. He asked me to go out to supper with him that evening, but I couldn't. Then a few days later he telephoned. The first years of our married life before the war seemed to have been spent traveling around the world like a couple of whirlwinds. Richard genuinely loved to travel. He never wanted to put down roots. Our home was always in a hotel. Life with him was hectic and exciting, an opera season in Vienna and a film in Britain, an operator in Egypt, and concerts everywhere, from Hollywood to Harrogate, from Australia to Africa. Always he was bubbling with life and energy and enthusiasm. Music was his life, and wherever he went, his piano had to go to. But Evelyn, you were talking about the films he made in England. The next one, you know, was Land Without Music, in which he teamed with Jimmy Durante. Land of Art Music was the story of an Italian principality at the beginning of the last century, whose inhabitants were so devoted to music that they had no time to do any work. As a result, the princess issued a decree forbidding the sound of music throughout the country. In this scene from the soundtrack, Richard Tauber, who played a world-famous tenor Carlini, had just rescued from the hands of a local brand of brigands an American newspaper man played by Jimmy Durante, and his daughter, played by June Clyde. Thank you, Signor. That was very good of you. I'm Jonah J. Whistler of the New York Monthly Gazette, America's leading newspaper. Pop's the only one that thinks so. Oh, this is my daughter, Sadie. I am Carlini. Carlini? Carlini the Great? Are these bandits friends of yours? Of course, everybody's my friend. One can't be too particular in a foreign country, huh? Not to say that you in, Pop. My daughter, Sadie. Your parents, permit me. Of course we'll permit you, if your friends don't mind. Any friend of Carlini's is our friend. Comrade, Senior Whistler from New York City. Bravo! Bravo! 
<laughs> Thank you. You see, we were on our way to Luco when uh, these gentlemen sort of took a fancy to us. You were going to Luco? Yes. So was I. Every year, Carini comes back to the land of his birth to sing to his people. And what do I find? Music forbidden. And my own concert cancelled by the princess. Colleen is a great. Forbidden to sing in his own country. What a story. Sadie, take some dictation. What is a country without music? What is Carini in a land without music? A chicken with his head cut off. What an insult to a great artist. It's a catastrophe. It was about this time that I had my own special memories of dear Richard. We played together in Charles B. Cochran's London production of Leha's operetta, Paganini. What lovely memories come back to me when I hear that record. When war came, Richard was in South Africa. He hurried back to Britain, and in 1940, proudly received his naturalization papers. He gave his services generously in aid of war charities, and in towns all over the British Isles, that glorious voice brought pleasure and comfort in the midst of wartime's anxieties. frequently toured with him was Josie Theron, who had played opposite him in Land of Smiles. When I first appeared in London with Richard, in the Land of Smiles, he couldn't speak a word of English. So the dialogue was arranged so that I did all the talking. And he said just yes or no. Sometimes he would say it in the wrong place. When he realized he was wrong, he would put on an expression like a naughty child. I sang with him altogether about seven years. And during the bombing, we had some very rough times. But however severe the blitz, I never saw him turn a hair. He loved film. And sometimes he would go twice a day. He was never happier or more relaxed than in a cinema. He was a very simple, happy-go-lucky person. And it was a great joy to sing with him. During the early years of the war, Richard came across a play by Walter Ellis, which struck him as exactly right as a basis for an operetta. He'd been looking for such a story for a long time. It was a period piece, of course, 18th century, and the setting was England. It was quite a startling novelty for an operetta. 
He began work on the music, and in February 1943, at the Princess Theatre, it began a long and successful run. It was called Old Chelsea. Mm -hmm. Richard's leading lady in old Chelsea was Carol Lynn, and she remembers very vividly her first meeting with him. My first sight of Richard Tarver was in the Stowell Theatre early one morning in 1942. I had been sent by my agent to give an audition for this new operetta. Well, my turn came to sing at last, and I walked petrified onto that large, bare stage, and I looked out to the stalls. And there was a big teddy bear of a man, dressed in one of the boiler suits that he so loved to wear. 
his feet apart and his hands on his hips. I came to know that typical Taba attitude very well in the years to come. Well, he waved to me to begin. I opened my mouth and nothing came out. My throat seemed to close up. All my fear that I'd never be able to play opposite Taba overwhelmed me. I turned to go off feeling awful when suddenly I heard a voice say, Schnappler. He used to call everyone Schnappler. Schnappler, come down here. I want to talk to you. Well, he started to talk about this new operetta he'd written and the part that I'd have to play. And his great enthusiasm and, and obvious love of his work so captured me that when at last he suggested that I might like to sing a little, I couldn't wait to show him what I could do. Well, I, I got the part, and through Richard's great help, it made quite a difference to my career. And during the years to come, Richard became a very dearly loved friend of my husband and myself. We miss him very, very much. Richard's next appearance in the theater was as a conductor. He was invited to conduct the orchestra at the Palace Theatre for a revival of Johann Strauss's De Fledermaus. For the occasion, it had been given a new title, Gay Rosalinda, and a new set of lyrics by Sam Hepner. I remember going into a very cold rehearsal studio and seeing Richard in a great blue boiler suit, looking like a Chinese soldier or Winston <laughs> Churchill. I, I didn't quite know what, but there he was conducting. And uh, I had the impression immediately, you know, that he'd somehow... Uh, distilled the magic of the old Vienna, which, I mean, to people of our generation, is just a sort of nostalgia of the mind. We didn't actually know it, but we felt that somehow it was right, and that he was recapturing the authentic spirit of Vienna, the Vienna we knew. Yes. Came the first night, inevitably, as the first night does, and uh, there was a tremendous thrill. It was... I've never known uh, a first night to um, have this feeling about not so much the artist, but the conductor himself. There was this odd feeling that there was something different about the whole sort of orchestral presentation of the of the uh, operetta. Yes, of the magic. The magic. Mm -hmm. And it was Tarp. It was his personality, and it was this intense feeling for music and this love that he obviously had for the music of the old Vienna. <laughs> As the war ended, Richard went off with his wife on his travels again, to the United States and to the West Indies. He returned to London to conduct another operetta at the palace, Zeller's The Bird Zeller, and to appear in a series of broadcasts, The Richard Tauber Half Hour. They were produced by Ronnie Waldman. How did you get on together, Ronnie? Well, it was impossible not to enjoy working with him. He was a bubbling, emotional, effervescent dynamo with an almost schoolboy's enjoyment of life. Mm. And all this excitable energy was poured into his love of music. His face was always alive, and laughter, as you know, Boo, was always very near the surface. <laughs> when he sang, his eyes sparkled, and his hands were thrust out in front of him with the palms downwards as if he were pulling the music along with him. He used to walk with a springing, bouncing step, and his gestures were full and free, but never really extravagant. Only once did I ever see him really quiet. Oh? When was that? Well, we used to have a, a guest artist in each of his programs, usually a celebrated instrumentalist. But one week, for a special program, I arranged to book a comparatively unknown amateur choir, the then little-known Luton Girls Choir. At first, Richard was angry about this. He didn't like amateurs. He said he wanted professionals. But I thought I could overcome his objections. I called the choir for rehearsal half an hour before Richard was due to arrive. Mm -hmm. The girls were singing a Landon Ronald song when the door burst open and Richard, as usual, exploded into the studio. Mm -hmm. Well, as he heard the sound of the girls' voices, he stopped as if he'd been polaxed and remained absolutely motionless until the end of the song. And then, very quietly and very slowly, 
He started to walk across the huge studio towards them. And as he got closer, I could see that tears were streaming down his face. That's a nice story, Ronnie. And it does illustrate how he loved any good performances. He loved music, all different types. We haven't yet heard him sing a really good popular song, which he did so perfectly. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas Just like the ones I used to know Where the treetops listen And children listen To hear sleigh bells in the snow For some months, Richard had suffered from a lung complaint that caused him great pain and considerable anxiety. He was advised to enter a hospital for an operation. Before he would do so, however, there was one engagement that he insisted upon fulfilling. The Vienna State Opera Company were to play at Cotton Garden, and Richard had been invited to sing once again one of his supreme roles, that of Octavio in Don Giovanni. Singing with him that night was Elizabeth Swatskopf, Yes, I remember I had the great experience that night to sing for the first time in my life with Richard Tauber, whom I used to know only from records and whom, of course, I adored like everybody else. Mm -hmm. When I remember that performance, that those two nights he sang with us, uh, we were all absolutely awestruck to see this obviously ailing man, we didn't know how ill he was, nobody of us knew anything, sing with the most supreme control I've ever witnessed on any stage. You know, Don Elvira, in the last act, when Don Octavio sings his famous aria, has got to stand in front of him and watch him very closely. And I've watched many tenors nearly dying from those excruciate, excruciating difficulties of this aria. But Richard Tauber sang that music with such a supreme control of breath and technique and musicianship. There was not the slightest trace of any non mozartian unstylistic unstylistic things. It was so pure and so wonderful and clear that we all thought here is the great master showing us how Mozart should be sung. And I will always remember that. Tell me, which aria was this? Il mio tesoro. A few weeks later, in the early hours of January the 8th, 1948, Richard Tauber died. Let us end the story with the sound of that magnificent voice still echoing in our ears. Il mio tesoro intanto Andati, andati
cercate, cercate di asciugar, cercate, asciugar. Ditele che i tuoi torti And so ends a recording of the Richard Talbot story, written by Roy Plumley and told by Evelyn Lay. The following artists also took part. Jane Baxter, Josie Fearon, Bernard Groom, Sam Hepner, Percy Kahn, Carol Lynn, Diana Napier, McQueen Pope, Oscar Price, Elizabeth Schwarzkopf, Anton Walbrook, and Ronnie Waldman. The orchestra was the BBC Variety Orchestra, leader John Jezzard, conductor Paul Fenley, with Iris Bourne, soprano, and the Linden Singers. You also heard the recorded voice of the late Richard Tauber. The program was produced by Michael North.